This episode of Ben Franklin's World is brought to you by Cornell University Press. In her new award-winning book, Who Should Rule at Home? Confronting the Elite in British New York City, Joyce D. Goodfriend explores why we shouldn't limit the early American history of New York City to privileged white men. Instead, Goodfriend argues that we should expand our historical understanding of early New York to include the contributions of ordinary New Yorkers, artisans, laborers, slaves, servants, women, and children. Because between 1664 and 1776, they played a big role in the city's history by pressing the city's elite white men to cede cultural power. At the heart of Good Friends history, you'll find the standoffs, confrontations, and negotiations that took place as New Yorkers experimented with ways to reconcile elite Anglo ideals with more motley perspectives. In fact, reviewers have noted that Who Should Rule at Home teams with stories about early New Yorkers' ethnic, religious, and social unrest. They've also stated that this book promises to become the definitive book about early New York City. To discover more about Who Should Rule at Home, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Cornell. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Kovar. Hello, and welcome to episode 121 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. When we think about Europeans who established slave trading factories in Africa and established colonies in the Caribbean and in the Americas, we typically think about the Spanish, the English, and the French. Those European nations and peoples certainly played large roles in the origins of colonial America, but we also need to think about the Dutch, because they too had a moment in the 17th century Atlantic world. Between 1590 and the 1670s, the Dutch built an empire in the Atlantic world, both by establishing new colonies and by conquering the colonies of others. They also played a leading role in the African slave trade, which had huge ramifications for the entire Atlantic world. Wim Kloster, a professor of history at Clark University and author of The Dutch Moment, War, Trade, and Settlement in the 17th Century Atlantic World, will guide us through the Dutch Atlantic world so that we can better understand and see Dutch contributions to colonial America. During our conversation, Wim reveals the lands and places encompassed by the Dutch Atlantic world, reasons why the Dutch sought to establish an empire in the Atlantic, and the types of people who settled in Dutch Atlantic colonies. But first, have you listened to episode 112 yet? This episode is with Mary Beth Norton, and it's all about the tea crisis of 1773. I ask because this episode is also a preview of the new Doing History to the Revolution series that I'm working on with the Omohundro Institute. And in two weeks, we're going to offer you a second preview. So if you haven't already listened to episode 112, why not put it on your playlist? It will give you a good idea of what the new series will be about and it will help you get excited for our next preview in two weeks. Okay, back to the 17th century. Are you ready to explore the Dutch Atlantic world? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Today, we welcome a professor of history at Clark University who specializes in the history of the Atlantic world. He has published numerous essays and articles in five different languages, and he has authored five books. Today, he joins us to discuss the Dutch Atlantic world with details from his newest book, The Dutch Moment, War, Trade, and Settlement in the 17th Century Atlantic World. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, Vim Kloster. Thank you. Vim, before we dive into our exploration of the 17th century Dutch Atlantic world, I think we need to define what that world looked like and what it consisted of at its height. Would you describe the Dutch Atlantic world for us? I mean, what lands and peoples did it encompass? So at its height in the early 1640s, the Dutch Atlantic encompassed parts of coastal West Africa, including Elmina in what is today Ghana, and Luanda in what is today Angola. On the other side of the ocean, half of Brazil was in Dutch hands, as were half a dozen Caribbean islands. And finally, the Dutch had established themselves in the area called New Netherland in between New England and Virginia. Wow, that's a lot of territory. I mean, especially when you consider how small the Netherlands is. That is right, yes. It was one of the smallest colonizing powers in history, you might say. Now, the Dutch began their foray into the Atlantic world around 1590, 
And when you look at the big picture of the Atlantic world, 1590 seems rather late. I mean, the Spanish and Portuguese have been active in the Atlantic from the 1490s onward. So, Vim, what prompted the Dutch to get involved in the Atlantic world when they did? And why did they venture to Africa, the Caribbean and the Americas? It was actually the Dutch War of Independence, the Dutch Revolt against Spain, that prompted them to get involved in the Atlantic world, just like it did in the Indian Ocean. There's an economic side to this story and there's a political side. So the economic side is that Dutch merchants during this war were ousted from the Iberian Peninsula by successive Spanish kings. And that led them to search for alternative areas to buy goods that they were familiar with, such as salt, which had always come to southern Spain and Portugal, but that was no longer possible. And this search for salt led them to various corners of the Atlantic world. But there was also a political side, and that was more important, the political side to the Dutch transatlantic expansion. The West India Company, a company that coordinated Dutch activities throughout the Atlantic, wanted to open a new front in the war against the Iberian enemies. And in order to divert the war away from the low countries and take it to the area where they knew that the Spanish had collected a tremendous amount of wealth, this was the source of the war machine of the Spanish, the silver that was produced in Mexico and Peru. So if the Dutch could get hold of that in one way or another, the Spanish would lose out on it and it would help you know, the Dutch stay afloat in their war against Spain. So it sounds like the Dutch entered the Atlantic world first as a mission of war against the Spanish and second as a mission to establish colonies. The idea was we might be able to establish ourselves in areas that are relatively peaceful while at the same time waging this war with Spain. But from the very beginning, there was this goal of capturing colonies from the Spanish and the Portuguese. The two countries were united between 1580 and 1640. And I think that's a big difference with the way that the English or the French established themselves in the New World, especially the French later on in the 17th century, where they actually go specifically to areas where the Spanish and Portuguese cannot be found, whereas the Dutch almost seem to go on purpose to areas where they find the enemy. Would you tell us a bit about the Dutch Revolt? Earlier, you mentioned that it was this war for independence that really prompted the Dutch to venture into the Atlantic world. Yeah, so at the time that Spain and Portugal expanded across the Atlantic, as you mentioned in the 1490s, early 16th century, the Dutch did not exist yet as residents of an independent country. Instead, they lived in provinces that were ruled at the time by Burgundy in the late Middle Ages. In the 16th century, these provinces, 17 different provinces in the area of what is today the Netherlands and Belgium, ended up in the lap of Habsburg Spain, Spain ruled by the Habsburg family. And while under that rule, provinces rebelled, starting in 1568, over both religious and fiscal matters, most specifically the Spanish persecution of Calvinism. And it's that war that becomes the Dutch Revolt and that leads to Dutch independence, which is only recognized by the Spanish 80 years later, so in 1648. Now that we know why the Dutch ventured into the Atlantic, let's discuss how they ventured into the Atlantic. Fim, would you tell us about the creation and operation of the Dutch West India Company? So individual Dutchmen had been active in the Americas in the 16th century, often in the service of the Spanish before the war broke out. But something changes around 1590. Dutch merchants then begin to access markets across the ocean in both Africa and in the New World. And these activities continue in some fashion until 1621. In 1621, a new chapter begins in the war between Spain and the Dutch. There had been a ceasefire of 12 years. And that ceasefire comes to an end. And both sides are then ready to continue the war effort. And it's under these circumstances that the Dutch established their West India Company. The West India Company was thought of as being some kind of Atlantic counterpart of the East India Company that had been founded before and that was very active in Asia. So the West India Company is founded in 1621. It's charged with trade, with migration. But the main goal, the military goal, was overwhelmingly important. So you might say that first and foremost, this West India Company is a war machine and not a commercial company like the East India Company. And what were the company's military goals? The Dutch begin almost immediately with a so-called grand design, a very optimistic, a very ambitious plan to conquer as many colonies that were Spanish or Portuguese on either side of the Atlantic Ocean as possible. And they start with sending a fleet to Bahia, Salvador de Bahia, the capital city of Brazil, in order to conquer that. At the same time, a fleet leaves for Elmina in West Africa. And with every step, the idea was, of course, we're going to succeed. So we're going to build on that with the next step. But from the very start, things went awry. For instance, the Dutch do manage to conquer Bahia, the capital of Brazil, but they only hold on for about a year and then it's lost again. 
their invasion of Elmina in the 1620s failed miserably. And the enormous investments don't seem to pay off. In the end, the Dutch do end up, of course, with a good part of Brazil. But a lot of damage had already been done. This West India Company, from the very start, is on the brink of bankruptcy and has to be held up by the Dutch government, the States General. Interesting. You know, the fact that the Dutch West India Company teetered on the brink of bankruptcy makes me wonder, did the company's military goals conflict with its goals to realize a profit through trade? That's an interesting question. Yes, you could say that on the one hand, the Dutch do import a tremendous amount of sugar and tobacco from Brazil, which had been the goal from the start. The Dutch merchants who had been trading there before 1621 knew that this was the world's largest sugar producer. So the idea was Brazil is the weak link in the Spanish empire. We might be able to pull this off. The Portuguese are suffering under the yoke of the Spanish, and it's a very lucrative colony. So this is a good way to start our grand design. But when you think about what then happened, and let's focus for a moment on Brazil, the Dutch, by 1635, conquer a large sugar-producing area. And for about 10 years, they export large amounts of sugar and tobacco, but certainly not the same amounts that the Portuguese had exported in the decades before. And that is because there was a war going on in Brazil. There are only a few years in Brazil where the Dutch are safely in control and there's no rebellion against them. And for most of the time, it means that the enemy, the Dutch enemy, is pursuing the scorched earth policy in which sugar plantations are completely destroyed. So compared to the plans that the Dutch had laid out and the enormous amount of money that they thought they could make as profits and then invest in the war machine at home, the actual proceeds from Brazil were quite small. Let's talk a bit more about Brazil. Because when many of us think about the colonies of the Dutch Atlantic world, we tend to think of New Netherland. But in the Dutch moment, you point out that Brazil was really the heart of the Dutch Atlantic Empire. So would you tell us more about how the Dutch came into possession of a portion of Brazil? As I've just said, the Portuguese thought of Brazil as some kind of a weak link in the uh, chain of the Spanish Empire. Since 1580, Portugal was part of the Spanish realm, but it was also clear that Spain had forced the Portuguese into this union. And the Dutch thought that the Portuguese inhabitants of Brazil, because they were suffering under the Spanish yoke, that they would flock to them if they invaded Brazil. Dutch merchants had acquired not just information about the trade, but also intelligence about port cities and where an invasion might be successful. So on the one hand, they think it's feasible to invade. At the same time, they know it's lucrative. Brazil, again, was the largest producer of sugar in the world in the late 16th, early 17th century. So the Dutch count on Brazil. They first invade the capital city of Bahia. They lose that, and then they come back. They come back in 1630, and this time it is successful in the sense that they're able not just to establish their presence close to the coast, but expand the territory under their control in the years to come. In about 12 years, they expand to half of the coastline of Brazil, which is in the Dutch hand. So the Dutch have to be found in the north, the Portuguese in the south. And from the perspective of the Dutch, this might go in the direction of a complete control of Brazil. So from the commercial perspective, the idea is we're not just going to be in control of part of the trade as they had been before 1621, we're going to control everything, we're going to control production, distribution, and overseas trade of sugar and tobacco. You noted earlier that the Dutch only experienced peace in Brazil for a short period of time during their settlement. Why were there so few peaceful years for the Dutch? Only in the early 1640s, uh, there are a few years where they enjoy peace, and even then there are tensions with the so-called Luso-Brazilians, the local population in their midst. Otherwise, they were always facing foreign troops, whether these were locally born men that rose in revolt, or those who were serving the Spanish Empire. Or, after 1640, when Portugal becomes independent of Spain, it's Portuguese soldiers that are sent to Brazil to defend this colony. So the Dutch were always at war, except for just a few years. And then finally, in 1654, they lose Brazil when they surrendered, surrendered really quite easily to Portuguese war fleet that had just arrived. So if Brazil was the heart of the Dutch Atlantic Empire, What role in place did New Netherland have within the empire? Brazil was by far the most important in the sense that it was key to this grand design, key to the war with the Spanish. And you can see that reflected in the number of soldiers and the investments in the military machine. You can also see that reflected in the commercial importance of Brazil. So in those senses, in the military sense and in the commercial sense, New Netherlands was very important, was actually quite marginal to the Dutch Atlantic world. It's more important, though, as a pole of migration. 
quite a number of people do migrate to New Netherlands, however small migration was in the Dutch Atlantic Group. So it did receive people from not just the Netherlands, but other parts of Europe by way of Amsterdam ended up in the Netherlands. So in that sense, it was more important than most other colonies. The Dutch warred with indigenous peoples, the Spanish and the Portuguese while in Brazil, but they also learned how to build plantations and grow sugar. Fim, did the Dutch take any of these lessons from their time in Brazil to settle other colonies in the Atlantic world? I think you can say that it was in Dutch Brazil that the Dutch allowed for the very first time Jews to openly live in the Americas in accordance with their faith. So here in 1636, for the very first time in the history of the Americas anywhere, a synagogue is opened in Recife, in the Dutch capital of Brazil. And this is even three years before the first public synagogue opens in Amsterdam. And what this means is that Dutch Brazil paves the way for a Jewish life in freedom in the Americas that hadn't existed before. There had been Jews. They had always been forced to hide their religion, certainly in the Spanish and Portuguese colonies where they might end up in the clutches of the Inquisition. But after the first synagogues in the Americas opened their doors in Brazil, that example is followed in other Dutch colonies and soon in English colonies as well. So it's usually these first Jews who had lived in Brazil who go back to Europe, but who then end up as pioneers of new Jewish communities in the Caribbean and North America. And they benefit from the privileges that had been given in Brazil and that become in the hands of the Dutch and the English some kind of a blueprint for the new privileges given in new colonies founded in the Caribbean islands, in Guyana, in North America. So in that sense, I think the Dutch used this experiment in Brazil, you might say, to develop their other colonies. Now, when you say the Jews receive new privileges, what sorts of privileges do you mean? Well, for instance, retail trade was very important. Even in Amsterdam, although the Jews sometimes are active there, even such a basic right as engaging in retail trade was not allowed in Amsterdam, but it was allowed in Brazil. And then there are other rights, and sometimes they're not granted immediately, but they're subject to negotiations, such as the right to work on Sundays or the right to have your slaves, because Jews own slaves as well, your slaves work on Sundays, or the right not to appear in court on the Jewish Sabbath on Saturdays. So such privileges were often then put on paper and became you know, the traditional privileges of the Jewish community in individual colonies. Many people know that the Dutch had a policy of religious toleration during the 17th century. Would you tell us more about this policy And whether it was this policy that prompted the Dutch to give Jews more privileges in their colonies? Yeah, so the Dutch, as you say, they're famous for religious tolerance. But I think you shouldn't see religious tolerance as a measure that they adopted in order to have people move from Europe to their colonies. When you look closely, the rights that are given to individual groups are actually granted to those who are already on the ground by the time that the Dutch invade and conquer. So once the Dutch move into Brazil, they come with a group of measures that include the idea that both Catholics and Jews should be granted religious freedoms. And that is because the Dutch were aiming at establishing colonies in places that they conquered and therefore wrested from the Portuguese and the Spanish. And the idea was, obviously, you have a Catholic population there, but there's also a fairly large Jewish population that is hiding its religion. So we're talking about the so-called crypto-Jews. For the Dutch to establish themselves in these colonies, it would mean that obviously they did come with soldiers, but in the beginning, certainly not with migrants, and that they would have to rule a population that was overwhelmingly non-Dutch and therefore Catholic and Jewish. So as a means to stabilize the population, the idea was we are going to grant these people religious freedoms. The same happens when the Dutch, under Peter Stuyvesant, the governor of New Netherland, conquer New Sweden, the Swedish colony that existed in Delaware. So in 1655, the Dutch conquer this colony. And what they find is a Lutheran population, a population that is not Calvinist, like many of the Dutch, certainly the Dutch officials of the West India Company, but is Lutheran. They also allow these Swedes, unlike in other Dutch colonies, to continue practicing Lutheranism. We've mentioned Jews, we've mentioned Lutherans, and we've even talked about soldiers. It really sounds like the Dutch colonies had diverse populations. Would you tell us more about the types of people who settled in the Dutch Atlantic colonies? Yes. So what you find in the Dutch colonies is often people with an urban background. And that is in part because the Dutch Republic itself was heavily urbanized compared to most other countries in the world. Uh, Only perhaps in Italy you would find a similar grade of urbanization. And therefore, there are lots of merchants and traders and small business owners, innkeepers. Innkeepers are ubiquitous in Dutch America. So unlike, you know, colonies in other parts 
of the Americas, there are relatively few people from the countryside who move. New Netherland, though, is different from the other Dutch colonies in that it seems to have attracted more farmers, especially rural laborers from the eastern and central parts of the Dutch Republic. And these people are reputed to be good and hardworking farmers. They are specifically recruited in order to come to New Netherland. And this is also a part of the Dutch Republic that is, in that period, coping with economic hardship, unlike other parts of the Dutch Republic. So one very important reason why there is relatively few migration to the Dutch colonies compared to certainly the English colonies is that the economy is really doing pretty well until about 1670 in the Netherlands. Did Dutch colonists settle in family groups like their counterparts in New England, or were they more like their counterparts in the Chesapeake who migrated mostly as single men? What you see is that the rule is clearly single men, in part because the Dutch colonization is so militarized. There's so many soldiers that arrive that in some colonies, the number of men in a garrison is larger than the number of colonists. And obviously, these men, there are no women among them. It changes when you look at New Netherland and also Brazil. There is clearly family migration, especially to New Netherland, especially starting in 1650, when there's a clear growth in immigrants in the last 15 years or so of the Dutch colony in New Netherland. But elsewhere, you find a clearly male-dominated society, almost in these early years of the Dutch colonies, as if you're dealing with a shipboard community. So sometimes they're dealt with in the same way, and it doesn't look like the kind of colonies that you might think of when you certainly think of New England. When these mostly male settlers decided that they were ready to start families, did they return to the Netherlands, or did they remain in the colonies and marry indigenous or African women and start families? That's an interesting question. It's very rare. It does happen, but it's really rare to see a Dutchman engaging in lasting relationships with natives in the Americas or with Africans. It does happen in the long run in the Dutch colony of Elmina, where you see that by the late 17th century and in the 18th century, the Dutch who go there usually arrive without a wife whether they're officials or soldiers, end up in relationships with native African women. But during this period in the 17th century, there are very few examples of that. And therefore, you might say that societies are still relatively unstable in the beginning. Over time, more and more women do begin to arrive, though. There's a clear difference in the New Netherland between the 1650s and the 1630s. There are clearly more and more women arriving, and there are obviously then both boys and girls being born. So it changes. Now that we have an idea of the Europeans who settled in the Dutch Atlantic, let's talk about these European settlers' relations with the indigenous peoples who lived in the areas they settled in. Fim, what were indigenous Dutch relations like? There were always tensions with the indigenous peoples. There's an interesting contrast between, on the one hand, the ideas that the Dutch had of the natives of the indigenous peoples before they first settled. The idea was that since the natives are suffering under the Spanish regime, they have been killed and murdered and subjected to economic coercion. They are our natural allies, that we are the enemies of their enemies. And therefore, once we arrive, they will probably flock to our side and become our allies. That clearly did not happen. And even though there are attempts by the Dutch to sit around the campfire in Chile, for instance, on two occasions in the 1590s and the 1640s, to discuss a common strategy against the Spanish, the natives early on find out that the Dutch are not really different from the other Europeans. And therefore, there are always tensions. The Dutch, for instance, engage in the enslavement of natives, both in Guyana and also on the Dutch island of St. Eustatius. And they also do that in northern Brazil, where there's a local rebellion that is caused in part by the Dutch enslavement of natives that is successful. And therefore, the Dutch have to vacate that part of Brazil. And what this meant is that for ordinary settlers from Europe, who had left Europe behind. Europe was war-torn in this period. There was the Thirty Years' War, there was the Dutch Revolt, there were other wars going on. And they'd moved to the Americas. They found themselves in colonies where, in part because of the indigenous threat, life was not very safe either. It was quite violent. African slaves composed a third party who settled in the Atlantic world. Fim, to what extent did the Dutch use African slaves in their Atlantic colonies? It was used quite extensively. The Dutch arrive in the Atlantic world in the 1590s. In the first decades, there are very few examples of Dutch slave ships transporting Africans to the Americas before 1635. I think there are only about a dozen examples of that. But everything changes once the Dutch capture this large sugar area from the Portuguese in Brazil by 1635. Then immediately, the West India Company orders ship captains to go to the African coast, orders local merchants to start buying slaves. And whatever objections the Dutch 
might have had before, and there were clearly Calvinist ministers who doubted whether this was morally right, that seems to vanish by the mid-1630s. In Brazil, where the Dutch encounter an existing slave society, they just decide to leave it all in place. And the idea is, and you find that quoted over and over again, that without slaves, we will not be able to run this society, to run this economy. So we are actually not in a luxury position to say we can do without slaves. But the Dutch then begin engaging in the enslavement of Africans on quite a large scale. Even after they lose Brazil in 1654, they continue the slave trade. And what's interesting then is that instead of bringing Africans to their own colonies, which they continue doing to some extent, the bulk of their slaves is transported to non-Dutch colonies to English colonies like Barbados, which is developing very rapidly in this period, and especially to the French colonies. And the math that I did for this book shows that between 1640 and 1670, almost half of the slaves on the Middle Passage between Africa and the Americas, almost half of these slaves in these decades come on Dutch ships. Our discussion of Dutch participation and really leading role in the African slave trade leads us to an interesting comment that you made in the Dutch moment, which is that the Dutch really never saw themselves as empire builders, but as merchants. Would you expound upon this idea a bit by telling us about Dutch trade in the Atlantic world? Did the Dutch confine themselves to the Atlantic slave trade, or did they participate in other trades as well? Yes. Let me first say something about the point that you're making. There is actually a moment in the 1630s where the Dutch and some foreign commentators also begin to see the Dutch as an empire of sorts, in that there is continuously news about new battles being won by the Dutch in Brazil, by new victories in the East Indies. And there are some in that period who begin to praise the Dutch as a kind of a modern empire, even an empire, according to one of the main literary figures of the Dutch Republic at the time, that outdoes the Romans because they defeat enemies that are more inhumane and that are more remote than any of the enemies that the Romans had ever faced. That's a fairly brief period, of course, soon enough the Dutch will start losing terrain in Brazil. But most of the time, the Dutch do indeed see themselves primarily as merchants, and that's how their rivals see them as well. What the Dutch were engaged in was clearly not just the sale of Africa. The Dutch were seizing whatever opportunities were presented to them. So they become on a very large scale involved in, for instance, sugar shipments from Barbados to Europe, tobacco shipments from St. Kitts to Europe. They almost monopolize French colonial trade around 1660. So there are very few French ships who actually cross the ocean and sell European products like textiles, hardware in exchange for local plantation crops. It's the Dutch who are doing this. That only begins to change in the 1660s when the French crown, Louis XIV and his minister Colbert, make it a point of building massive numbers of ships in order to oust the Dutch. So it kind of sounds like the Dutch operated as middlemen in the 17th century Atlantic world, in the sense that they were servicing the needs of different empires' colonies by bringing goods to those colonies that the colonists couldn't otherwise get. That's right. What you can say is now looking back in hindsight after so many centuries, many economic historians have identified the period after 1619 as one of sustained economic misery for most of Europe. The Dutch, on the other hand, are not part of that economic crisis. And that's in part because of their middleman status. And that middleman status allows them to be as active in transatlantic trade as they were. You might say that that then comes to an end once countries like France with its emphasis on French nationals having to be engaged in the trade with the colonies, or the English Navigation Acts. The same happens in places like Russia and Sweden, where the emphasis is on the need for locally born people, Swedes or Russians or Frenchmen or Englishmen, to monopolize the trade with the colonies. That makes it very hard for the Dutch to be involved. And that is one of the reasons why this Dutch moment comes to an end. Now, we know from our study of British and French colonial America, and the early United States for that matter, that merchants with one nationality couldn't always legally trade with merchants of another nationality, even if those merchants happened to just live across the river from each other. And yet, it sounds like the Dutch in the 17th century were able to trade with French colonists and English colonists. Yes, well, when the Dutch started out in the Atlantic world, these prohibitions against foreign traders were still few and far between in the French and English colonies. The First Navigation Act was only adopted in 1651, the second one in 1660. So in the early going, the Dutch still could trade on a large scale in East North America and the Caribbean, but they didn't do that in the Spanish colonies. 
because in the Spanish colonies, in the Spanish colonies, their ships would have been seized, as some of them who did try to find out at their cost, because they simply belonged to the enemy. But it's different in places like Virginia or Barbados, that's you know, been shown in the writings of American historians and how large the Dutch role was in these colonies, as I mentioned before, in the French Caribbean as well. So in the beginning, the Dutch are still able to fulfill this role of middlemen. But at some point, the prohibitions start working against them. Did the English and French pass their navigation acts because of the Dutch traders? Oh, it's very clear. Yes. I mean, there are other reasons as well. You know, one lesson of history is there's usually more than one factor involved, but in the navigation acts, there was a clear realization that the Dutch were very actively involved in the trade with the English colonies. With the French, there's even more proof that Louis XIV wanted to get rid of this massive Dutch role. It wasn't just between France and the colonies. It was even inside France where the Dutch were involved in shipping goods from A to B and B to C. So that had to end. Louis XIV in France wanted to be you know, boss in his own domain. He doesn't allow any other religions to exist anymore. And he certainly doesn't allow foreign traders to be as important as the Dutch were. You mentioned earlier that the Dutch Atlantic Empire, the Dutch moment, came to an end in the 1670s. And I wonder if you would tell us why the Dutch Empire ended roughly just 70 or 80 years after it began. So I think just like merchants seize opportunities that are presented to them, nations can do the same, peoples can do the same. The Dutch emerged as a colonial power during decades that saw rival countries struggle at home. I mentioned the economic problems that permeated Europe at the time, but the English had the Civil War, for example. Spain was facing all kinds of revolts in Portugal and Catalonia, in addition to the Dutch Revolt. So the Dutch don't seem to be affected that much by the economic crisis. And that means Dutch trade around the globe grew, which means in turn that tax income of the Dutch state increased. And therefore, expensive military expeditions could be financed. But as I mentioned, in the Atlantic world, the Dutch are overly ambitious. They believe that they can conquer as many Iberian colonies as they want. And in practice, it turned out not to be so easy. And once in the other countries, the domestic troubles begin to subside as an end to the Fronde in France, as an end to the civil war in England, as the restoration of the monarchy when Portugal is independent and Spain is no longer facing all these multiple rebellions. Then these countries begin to introduce policies that discriminate against foreign merchants in their own colonies. And of course, besides, these countries could turn the tables on the Dutch. You see that the Portuguese reconquer Brazil and Dutch Angola. Uh, the English removed the Dutch from New Netherland. The French ousted the Dutch from what was a very promising colony in Tobago in the Caribbean. So by 1670, by the 1670s, you might say that in a combined effort, even though it wasn't deliberate, these foreign countries cut down the Dutch to size. Now, Vim, when you look at the Dutch presence in the Atlantic world, in the grand scheme of history, it seems pretty short. So did the Dutch leave any lasting impact on the Atlantic world? That's an interesting question. Well, one impact, obviously, is that those people who were transported on Dutch slave ships ended up in a very different continent and ended up in lives of profound misery. And that was only the beginning what the Dutch did in this period when they were in control of Brazil, transport perhaps 25,000 Africans to the other side of the ocean, was the beginning of a slave trade that in the end involved more than half a million Africans. So clearly, that is a legacy on the part of these former Africans. You could also say that the Dutch left a legacy, but a very different one, in Brazil. So what happens in Brazil is that in 1645, a revolt breaks out against Dutch rule that lasts for nine years and that culminates in the Portuguese conquest of this colony. And to the Brazilians today, this in many ways is their golden age different from other countries in Latin America where the period to be proud of is the independence wars of the early 19th century where Spain was defeated, independence was declared. Here, there was a period in which local people rebelled against the Dutch and in the end were successful. So this is in the historiography of Brazil and in the minds of many Brazilians, this is a period to be very, very proud of. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if the Dutch West India Company had been established primarily as a trading company and administered as well as its counterpart, the Dutch East India Company. Would the Dutch have been able to build an Atlantic empire? And would the Dutch legacy in the Atlantic world be different? 
I think it wouldn't have been impossible for the Dutch to hang on to Brazil. You know, if Portugal, a country of comparable size and population, but much poorer, if that could hold on to Brazil, the Dutch should also have been able to control it. And there were clearly opportunities to do that during their last years in Brazil. The Portuguese king toyed with the idea of at least allowing the Dutch presence in one part of his colony. So going on then and speculating what might have happened is that the Dutch, in order to maintain some stability, would probably have chosen the kind of toleration of Catholicism that they also opted for in their Caribbean colonies. In Curaçao, for instance, Catholicism even becomes the largest religion in the late 17th or 18th centuries. So if that were the case, Brazil might have vied with the Dutch East Indies, uh, what is today Indonesia, for the status of the premier Dutch colony in the world. And that would have made, I suppose, for a very different kind of Atlantic war, where the Dutch would continue to have been a power to reckon with well into the 18th century. Tim, now that you've researched and written about the Dutch moment in the Atlantic world, what are you working on now? I have finished a manuscript that I co-authored with a Dutch colleague on what is the sequel to the Dutch moment. It's tentatively called the Second Dutch Atlantic, and it deals with the period starting in the 1670s and ending in 1815, ending with the defeat of Napoleon. So that book is in the making. And then I'm about to embark on a sabbatical in Europe, during which I will begin writing a biography of a conservative French nobleman who, in spite of himself, is part of all kinds of revolutions on either side of the Atlantic Ocean in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And where should we look for more information about how we can contact you if we still have more questions about the Dutch Atlantic world? Okay. The easiest is my email address, wkloster at clarku.edu. In general, I would say when you Google my name, you'll immediately end up with the websites that have all my information. No, there are not many people with my name. Fim Kloster, thank you for taking us through the Dutch moment. We really enjoyed learning about the Dutch Atlantic world of the 17th century. Thank you, Liz. My pleasure. War doesn't just bring violence and death. For some, it brings opportunity. And as Vim just helped us see, wars provided the Dutch with lots of opportunities to create their moment in the 17th century Atlantic world. The 80 Years' War Dutch Revolt is what propelled the Dutch out into the Atlantic. In a move to win their war for independence, the Dutch sought to seize the Spanish's lucrative colonies, which would not only deprive the Spanish of monies it needed to wage its war against the Dutch, but would also allow the Dutch to better finance its war effort against the Spanish. Now, wars between other nations also provided the Dutch with opportunities. While France, England, Spain, and Portugal waged wars against each other, the Dutch attempted to conquer and supply their colonies. Now, taking on this role of middlemen in the Atlantic world is what allowed the Dutch to become leaders in the African slave trade, and it also prompted them to broaden their implementation of religious toleration, both of which have created a lasting legacy in the Atlantic world. Now, speaking of the Dutch Atlantic world, I've just returned from a week-long trip to St. Eustatius, a former Dutch colony turned Dutch municipality in the Caribbean. St. Eustatius is another lasting legacy of the 17th century Dutch moment. The Dutch established a colony on the island in 1636 and developed it into a free port of trade in an effort to profit from both the slave trade and from supplying the needs of other colonies. Although St. Eustatius exchanged hands between the Dutch, French, and English about 22 different times between 1636 and the 19th century, the Dutch held on. And this is of huge importance to the United States. Because you see, Stacia sold the Americans roughly 50% of the arms and ammunition they needed to wage their war for independence. Stacia's keeping the Americans supplied posed a big problem for the British. So in February 1781, British Admiral George Rodney sailed his fleet to Stacia and plundered the island. And because the Dutch had excelled in their role as middlemen of the Atlantic world, Rodney stayed to continue plundering Stacia instead of following his orders to sail for the Chesapeake. Without Rodney's fleet to stop them, the French fleet sailed into Chesapeake Bay and connected with George Washington's forces at Yorktown. It's an 18th century event, but one is an American I would like to add to the legacy of the Dutch moment. Visit the show notes page for more information about Vim, his book, The Dutch Moment, and notes for everything we talked about today. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash 121. If the legacy of the Dutch in the Atlantic world interests you, you should visit BenFranklinsWorld.com slash Cornell and check out Joyce Goodfriend's new book, Who Should Rule at Home? Don't forget to use your special promo code 09BFW when you visit the Cornell University Press website because it'll save you 30% off Joyce's book and off other great titles.
Today's conversation provided us with an overview of the Dutch Atlantic world. What more about this world would you like to know about? Let me know by sending an email to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweeting me at Liz Covart, or by posting a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.